I'm telling you people, it's a wild, wild world out there, as Cat Stevens once said. He actually sang, ooh, baby, baby, it's a wild world. And while navigating that wild, wild world, I somehow managed to keep on coming back to my little cabin in the woods on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to bring you the latest episode of Tent Talks Tunes. Yes, kids, it is here, it is hip, it is hep, it is hap, it is hap, hap, happening right here, right now, all the way alive on the internet through the wonders of modern day technology, or at least we think it is. Let me reach on over here to my computerized uh, monitoring system, this thing that we call a uh, desktop computer where I can see if you guys are tuned in or not, or if I'm actually live or not, or if I'm just sitting here talking to myself, thinking that I'm going out live. It's happened before. It has definitely happened before. And apparently it's not happening right now because Ray Gelman from Tucson, Arizona is tuned in and Alan Versapellis is tuned in from his corner of the musical universe. Alan got the order for the CD. I will be sending that out probably tomorrow. So... Get your CD player unlimbered and prepare yourself. I don't know if the stuff I do on uh, CD is as harsh and unusual as what you do on CD, but I'm sure it's got merits. I'm sure it's got merits. Alan's a very intelligent guy. He reached out and he ordered via my Bandcamp page a copy of the very first CD I ever released, which is entitled Malcolm Tent's House Party. <clears throat> There's the front cover art to it. Picture of me in the year 2009. There's the back cover. You can see this is this is the real raw, unassembled artwork for a CD. I make all of these things by hand myself, utilizing the million mile scissors. There are the labels. And I have the discs manufactured over there on a stack that I don't feel like reaching over to get. So in just a matter of time, these disparate elements are going to be an actual finished product going to Alan himself, a fellow noisemaker and musician. So thank you, Alan, for that. And thank you for anybody and everybody who goes to Bandcamp and checks out TPOS, and thus by extension, little old me. Let's have a big old toast to me. <laughs> and to you, because we're all cool. <clears throat> Sooner than later on Bandcamp, I'm going to have uploaded for the first time ever the Mad Brother Ward Anthology CD slash cassette. It's going to be available for streaming and download and also physical media on the Bandcamp page. So that's pretty exciting. Mad Brother Ward has never had streaming media before and soon enough he will. And I'll just mention, I will reach over here and grab one of these. But, uh, by some strange quirk of fate, I do still have a few Mad Brother Ward anthology CDs. Each one is numbered out of a hundred. I also have some cassettes that are numbered from 1 to 108, and the cassettes have hand-signed inserts by the Mad Brother himself. People said a guy like Mad Brother Ward couldn't possibly be literate. I can assure you he's very literate. He can write his own name, and he did so 108 times for the cassette version of the Mad Brother Ward Anthology. So this is going to be on Bandcamp pretty soon. Even more incentive for you to hop on over there and check it out. Uh, so yeah, it's been a busy, busy, busy couple of weeks here. Uh, Clinton is uh, tuning in from Florida saying, Hydrate, it's hot. Yes, I can only imagine what it's like in Florida right now. Here in Connecticut, the humidity is up, the temperature is up, and it is a wee little bit steamy. <clears throat> so, yes, let's take a chug and keep ourselves healthy. Back when Mr. Brandon knew me, I was strictly a Dr. Pepper and Snicker bar guy. I look back upon those days in Florida in my punk rock youth, and I can't believe I even survived them. But we were all a little more bulletproof in those days, I think. Uh, <laughs> certainly not later. That's why we got to be careful and healthy and healthy and careful. You know what I mean, pair over in Sweden? Do you know what I mean? I think you do. I think you do. So anyway, yes, incredibly busy, busy, busy last week. Um, 
One week ago today, I was in the great state of North Carolina getting ready for the gala anti-scene gig at the Masquerade in Atlanta. We were personally invited, um, it turns out, by Fear's manager, which is a, a guy named Robert, who I used to know way back in the day. Robert used to be my uh, sales rep at SST Records. And then later, Robert went on to do some uh, managerial work for Devo. Devo, you know, I'm always sporting the Devo. <laughs> and now he is um, managing Fear. He's been Fear's band manager for, I think, eight or nine, seven or eight years. And he, I was totally surprised to see him at the show. We were loading in, we loaded in for sound check and we were getting ready to set up and rock out. And he comes up to me and I'm like, hey, dude. So we did a little bit of catching up and it turns out he told me that they personally requested that we be on the bill to open up for fear, which I thought was very, very nice. That was very humbling, very flattering, and uh, quite an honor to be put in that position. And I would dare say, just kind of judging by the chatter that I heard after the show and uh, by the reaction of the crowd while we were playing, that we lived up to said honor because we kicked some butt. There, I said it. <clears throat> I'm not afraid to toot my own horn when all of the evidence points to it being true, but yeah, it was a real good show. It felt good. The Masquerade was an excellent venue, fantastic sound on stage, totally professional crew and management. It was nothing but a pleasure to play the Masquerade in Atlanta, and of course, to be on, a, on the bill with fear. Boku excitement. So it ended up being a, a dynamite show. Really, really excellent and worth it, and thanks to everybody out there who might be tuned in, who came to the show. I see a couple of you people. Where is Amy? Yep, Amy. The Myerses were there. Awesome. Good to see you guys there. And maybe a couple others who I can't really see on the monitor there. So, yeah, really great to hang out and meet a lot of new people and meet a bunch of old friends and make new friends and just get to rock the heck out. So, yes, successful gig. And then the very next day, we went into the studio to record... Not one, but two, count them, two upcoming anti-scene singles. One's going to be a four-song EP. The other one is going to be a two-song seven-inch single. And we got all the basic tracks down in one marathon session on Saturday. We did rehearsals on Friday, worked out all the kinks, hammered them out. And then Saturday, we got there at 9 a.m. and just played and played and played and recorded and recorded and recorded until we got them all. Six songs, baby, coming out on vinyl. Well, whenever they come out, you know, these days we've learned not to try to prognosticate release dates, but um, <clears throat> the wheels are in motion. Mm -hmm. So yes, excellent, excellent week. <clears throat> Getting a lot of stuff done in the anti-scene camp. So that's where I was, and now here I am now getting ready to talk tunes. But first, let's take a look at the bulletin board and see what's going on in the aforementioned wild, wacky world of me, and thus by extension, you. What do we got going on here? Well, let's go chronologically, shall we? We have coming up September 2nd and September 23rd at the Beachland Ballroom in Cleveland, Ohio. The, oh gosh, what is 21st annual devotional Devo Fan Festival. Yes, two fine, fun, frolicking, festive days of uh, things Devo and relating to Devo. We have one guest announced, DJ Lance Rock from the Yo Gabba Gabba television show that Mark Mothersbaugh has recorded a lot of soundtrack music for and has made special cameo appearances on. So that's the Devo connection there. He is the first guest to be announced. You can bet your sweet bippy there will be plenty more. So it's, it's, excuse me, September 22nd and 23rd, Beachland Ballroom. My birthday is September 23rd also. How cool is that? The week after, you've heard about it. It's happening. I just teased it as my opening card. Anti-Scene's 40th anniversary show at the Ground Zero in Spartanburg, South Carolina. We spent a lot of time this past week when we were all together in Charlotte brainstorming and discussing various plans and nefarious ideas for the 40th. I got to tell you guys, 
There's a lot going on. We are going to be giving you a double dose of Destructo Rock. The theme is 40 songs for 40 years. So do what you got to do. Bring your, bring a lawn chair. Um, I don't even know what you do to be comfortable. Hell, don't even bother being comfortable. Just get there and get ready to be in to the groove for a good long time. We're going to give you a marathon set on September 30th with our special opening guests, Joe Buck Yourself and Sweet George Brown. Uh, there are hotel deals. I know people are flying in from all over the, literally from all over the world, all over the country. Really excited about this one. And we are going to give you the best show we possibly can. So my advice to you is don't miss it. After that, we go further into the future, October 21st, 2023, Danbury Record and CD Expo returns to VFW Hall number 149 in downtown Danbury. And if you think it's fun to sit here and watch Tent Talks Tunes and listen to me selling records, which is what I'm doing today, it's even more fun to go in person on site to a real life record show and see not only me, because I will have a couple tables spread out just full of vinyl and cassettes and CDs, but plenty of other fine record dealers as well. So put that on your calendar, October 20, I'm sorry, October 21st, yes, October 21st, Danbury Record and CD Expo at the VFW Hall 149 in Danbury. And of course, how could I have forgotten? I've been so excited and so wound up about all this great anti-scene business. I plumb forgot about the upcoming Profanautica tour. Two weeks from today, I will be on the road heading up to Ohio for the first gig of Profanautica's 2023 U.S. tour. First stop, Cleveland. Last stop, Raleigh, North Carolina. It's going to be mega. I'm sure you can find all the tour dates on... I don't know, somewhere, Profanatica's got a, a website or a Facebook page. Our U.S. label, Hell's Headbangers, does as well. I'll be posting some stuff pretty soon. So if you want to see me play the Thunder Lumba tuned down to a drop B, you will have your chance as I trod the boards with Profanatica for three solid weeks starting on July. What's the date? July 13th. Ooh, boy. That's the bulletin board. Uh, the mailbox has been kind of empty this week, but that's fine because we got a lot to talk about here and I just want to get right down to it. But if you do want to send me something and have it uh, talked about and shouted out here on Tent Talks Tunes, I'll give you the address. <clears throat> the address is kindly put right here. There it is, MT, P.O. Box 3626, Newtown, Connecticut, 06470. That's P.O. Box 3626, Newtown, Connecticut, 06470. And this, actually, we're going to do some show and tell right now. This did come in. This is a this is a job I'm working on. And this will give you guys an insight into the things I have to do to make ends meet as an itinerant, low-budget rock star and record peddler. I do a lot of... Um, I do digital transfers, like I, I transfer cassette and vinyl and other analog formats to digital, whether it be for a CD or a DVD or a thumb drive or whatever. I do a lot of digital conversions for a lot of people. I have also done a lot of repair work on physical media, such as cassettes, CDs, well, the CDs, you can't do nothing with a CD, but cassettes, um, VHSs, and as we will see when I open up this box, Utilizing the aforementioned million mile scissors, I'm going to do an attempted repair job on this thing sent to me by my good pal Jason in Texas. Jason is the guy who introduced me to the concept of purple drank. I didn't know there was such a thing until he uh, had me make, an, make him a big box of cassettes featuring screwed up hip-hop, fueled by purple drank. I couldn't even imagine that that was a genre, but it sure is. So Jason, you opened up my eyes to a couple of things. And Jason, besides being into screwed-up hip-hop, is also into physical media. 
And he wrote to me earlier wondering if his stuff got here in one piece. In one piece. It did. It actually got here in two pieces. Two pieces carefully wrapped and they're both intact. What am I repairing? What am I going to make whole for him? Well, let's find out, shall we? This is very exciting. I love this kind of stuff. What we have here, this is a cold open. Okay, we have the back of an 8-track tape. We have the inside of an 8-track tape, which you'll notice is conspicuously lacking one thing. It's lacking tape. And I think that's the problem. The hub is working very well. The hub is still turning and it's in good shape. What 8-track is this, you might wonder? Why would anybody go through so much trouble just, just, just to fix an 8-track? Well, any of you 8-track aficionados out there will probably gasp in astonishment when you see that the 8-track that needs to be fixed is Kiss Animal Eyes, which is a very rare title on 8-track. If my uh, factoids serve me correctly, this only came out via the Columbia Record Club. Maybe RCA Record Club had a version too, but it was never released in stores. You could only get it by mail order from uh, the record clubs. And so Jason actually has one, and something, I guess, went completely awry with the tape, so now we have an empty shell with no tape in it. So my mandate is to get some tape in this thing so we can actually play the sucker. So, Jason, if you're watching, I got it. It's here, just as you sent it in two pieces. And we're going to see if we can get a fix for this thing. I think it should be just a very simple matter of recording a new program on a new hub, dropping the hub in, aligning it, putting in new pads, making sure the splices are good, maybe replace the pinch roller if it needs it. There's, there's a lot of work that goes into these things, so... A day in the life of Malcolm Tent. You just got a big glimpse of it. Mm, mm, mm. It's not all CDs and vinyl, kids. It's 8-tracks as well. Salute to the last art of 8-track. I do want to do a little bit of show and tell before I get into the, uh, the crass commercialism part of it. You know, playing gigs is great because I'm an inveterate souvenir hunter. I love the physical objects. I love the artifacts. Of rock and roll. I love the things that come with rock and roll. You know, not just the records, the tapes, and the CDs, but the ephemera, and especially playing gigs. You get all kinds of great stuff. And I don't know, people think I'm really funny as I, as I go around the club picking these things up off of the floor and out the garbage cans, but these are real souvenirs for me. You know, for example, the um, backstage itinerary Masquerade has three venues. It's got Heaven, Hell, and Purgatory. We played the Hell Room, and that's the uh, reminder that they had in the in the, uh, the dressing room as to, you know, Doors of Seven, our set times, and all that. That's just cool. I love this kind of stuff. I save all these things. This is the um, sign directing everybody to the venue from the backstage load-in area, and I had it signed by Spit Sticks of Fear. And the Fear guitar player, who I'm sorry, I don't, don't remember your name, but I got you to sign these. I love this. Um, Lee Ving was not anywhere around to be found to do any signing, but hey, whatever. You get what you can in this business, right? Right. And just, you know, a few other things like that. Of course, obviously, we got to get the obligatory set list, the anti-scene set list from the show in Atlanta. Basically, my rule is... Audience gets first crack at the set list. If anybody in the audience wants a set list and asks for one, I am very happy to give them one. But if there's anything left over at the end of the night, it's mine. I'm taking it. Because I'm a collector. I love this kind of stuff. I also picked up a few um, from other groups. Like, I guess the Mad Caddies had played the night before. Big Ska Show. So I got their sign and I got their directional thing. You know, just all these kinds of things. I just, I just think they're really, really neat. So I got a few of those to add to my hope chest or my pile of clutter, depending on what you, uh, what you want to call it, how kind you're feeling about my weird habits and picadillos. <coughs> of course, I'm not only a member of the band, I'm a gigantic fan. So I had to take 
the test pressing of the forthcoming full-length anti-scene album Great Disasters, <clears throat> excuse me, Great Disasters, which is coming out very, very soon. I've had the test pressing in hand for quite a while, but of course I had to get it signed by everybody in the group. It's what I do. I'm not just in the band, I'm a fan. And lest anybody wonder what my motives are, I want you to put it right here. I signed it with the caveat right there that it is the property of Malcolm Tent, that this one belongs to me. And so as I told the boys in the band, if you ever see this on eBay, you'll know either that the rate at the homeless shelter has just gone up or I'm dead. One or the other. This goes into the hope chest as well. And, you know, and the only way I can get this done is when I'm in the same room with the other guys, you know, which the Jeff and Barry live in Charlotte. Our guitar player, Walt, lives in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and I'm, of course, here in Connecticut. So our opportunities to get together are, you know, not as often as, obviously, if we all lived in the same town together. So one's got to maximize one's productivity when one is together with one's bandmates. I will, of course need to mention that the brand new deluxe double LP reissue of Here to Ruin Your Groove is out. I'm not on it, but this, if I must say, people say all the time, hey man, what's your favorite anti-scene album? I gotta tell you guys, if I'm gonna just put on an anti-scene record for pleasure, just to listen to, this is one, this is the one, this is my go-to, Here to Ruin Your Groove. This is my favorite anti-scene album, hands down. And it's just come out as a double LP. The limited edition version is sold out, but there are still regular edition versions. I'm going to show you the limited version just so you get an idea of what's in here. You know, one reason why I love this band so much is that Anti-Scene doesn't do anything half-arsed. Everything Anti-Scene does is deluxe. So this is the... The difference between the limited and the regular is just the, is the colors of vinyl, but the packaging is the same. Heavy-duty gatefold sleeve. That's the outside. That's the inside. Two records, each one with a printed inner sleeve. That's one. That's the other. Of course, the colored vinyl. This is one of the limited colors of vinyl. This is the other limited color of vinyl. What else do you get in here? You get a super duper giant size poster. Looks pretty good when it's right side up too. What else do you get in this thing? Oh, you get um, a sticker. You get uh, compact disc. And that's all you get. As if that's not enough. So yeah, that's that's what you get when you buy one of these things. It's pretty dang cool. That's why I'm so proud and happy to be a member of this band, because the shiz is real, guys. The shiz is real. Now here's another thing, and this we're gonna we're gonna segue gradually into the topic of tent talk tunes tonight, which is of course show and tell, buy and trade. <clears throat> I have this sucker for sale. This is a vintage trademark of quality LP of Jethro Tull. Nothing is easy. This is 100% 100% legit Puka trademark of quality from 1972, I believe. Rubber stamp front. Trademark of quality sticker. Trademark of quality labels and blue vinyl. This is the real deal. This is not a repress. This is not a bootleg of a bootleg. This is original T-M-O-Q. It is for sale. The reason I'm showing this to you first is because we do have a special limited edition LP that is going to be for sale at our, our 40th anniversary show. Now, if you dig the aesthetic on this original Trademark of Quality LP, then you'll certainly dig the aesthetic on ours. 
And that's all I'm going to say, and that's all I'm going to show for now. All I can say is there's a lot of dang physical manual labor rubber stamping and sticking those things. You know what? It's worth it. 100% worth it. Because I am not just a fan, I'm also a collector. Did we mention that already? That I'm a collector as well? Well, I'm a collector. I don't just collect the tchotchkes from the gig, I collect the vinyl. Woo! I see the comments coming in here. Um, Thick and Furious Ray Gelman from Tucson says, reminder to get the anti-scene gift box for the Punk Rock Museum together. That is true. There's been quite a few photos floating around of an anti-scene sticker perched prominently on a pole at the Punk Rock Museum in Las Vegas, right? Someone uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Was it Las Vegas or Los Angeles? Ray, please tell me. You were there. You saw it. You showed me the picture. Wherever it is, this punk rock museum thing, anti-scene is represented in it. And that's cool. Very cool. Right. Now we're going to talk tunes for real. I just showed you one thing I got for sale here, and this is the way I do it. I, I show and tell these things, and if anybody wants them... Send me a personal message. Don't leave a comment there because I can't really monitor the comments in real time. But if you want something and you direct message me, that way I can go back after I'm done talking, excuse me, and I can look at the messages as they come in in chronological order. First come, first served. All is good. Everybody happy. So, yep, the first item that's up for grabs is indeed a vintage trademark of quality blue vinyl Jethro Tull album. Um, it's not in mint condition, but it does play all right. As we know, the, the uh, pressing quality on these things could be kind of dodgy sometimes. You never knew really exactly what you were getting. But um, it's in pretty decent shape, plays all the way through. As an artifact of this type of record from the early 70s, made by the real people, it being the real deal, it's really nice to have. Uh, the prices on these things went through the dang roof. One of one of the uh, co-founders of Trademark of Quality auctioned off all of his original rubber stamps, uh, metal parts for the records, uh, stickers, just whatever this guy still had left over from the Trademark of Quality days, he auctioned it all off. And that set off a feeding frenzy for things relating to Trademark of Quality. And um, these things used to be like I wouldn't say common necessarily, but you could find them. You know, and when I worked at the Open Books and Records in North Miami Beach, Florida, back in the 80s, they would come through often enough to notice, you know. And I never really thought that much of them. But, um, you know, when you consider that these things are basically about 50 years old each and were never made in large quantities to begin with and are definitely a part of a, a countercultural phenomenon, it's pretty cool. So I got one of these. Even if you don't like Jethro Tull, it's a cool artifact, a great reminder of a time and a place and an industry. So that's up for grabs. If anybody wants it, send me a message. I also have another Jethro Tull artifact. For those of you who dig this kind of thing, it's thick as a brick. Not only is it thick as a brick, it's the original... Bonafide first pressing with the super deluxe fold-out sleeve with the newspaper. The newspaper is completely intact. It's all there. And this thing is hilarious. I remember when I was a kid, uh, my next-door neighbor, Bill, had a copy of this record. And he let my, my father borrow it for a little while. So it was in our house for a while. And I was young, and I was, you know, reading the newspaper and... I didn't understand it in the slightest bit. I didn't know what was going on with anything that they were writing about on this cover. Because it's, it's very English, and the humor is excessively dry and pretty obscure. Even now, I don't really get all the references that they make in this thing, but I do understand it a lot better than I used to. Fans of Monty Python would probably dig the contents of this album cover. But this is it, kids. Stone Cold Original. First pressing. Intact with the newspaper itself. 
And I'm pretty sure the vinyl is in super duper mint condition because that's the way I like to deal with it. Got your original Warner Brothers Lost Leader sleeve. Nice reprise labels. This is, this is pre Warner Communications. It doesn't have the Warner Communications logo on it. And sure enough, that is in some minty fresh condition. All you clays and gals. So, Ray Gellin wants to know if it smells of elderberries. That's the smell of elderberries. I think that's Elton John you're thinking of there, uh, Ms. Gellman. If anybody gets that reference, feel free to comment. What else do we have here that I want to sell? This is kind of, a, you want to talk about esoteric. A bunch of years ago, I ended up getting a big pile of um, <clears throat> autographed opera albums. As you can see, this one is signed to Frank. I guess Frank was the guy who owned all of these things. And poor old Frank, I guess, shuffled off, uh, shuffled off from this mortal coil, is not with us anymore, and left behind this big stack of autographed albums, all opera, all classical. This one's signed by Eleanor, well, by Eleanor Steber herself. Hey, check it out. Autographed by Eleanor Steber. Steber, Steber. I don't know who the hell she is, but she signed it. I got a lot of these things. You'd be surprised. Let's see who this one's autographed by. Oh, look at that. This one's autographed by Jan Pierce himself. There he is. How many Jan Pierce records have you seen? Well, there's an autographed one. So many of these. Here's another one. I could not, on even on a good day, I could not tell you who Lucia Pop is. But that's her record and that's her signature. I got a couple of them. How about Christina Ludwig? You want an autographed Christina Ludwig opera record? Talk to me. Alexandra Kipnis autographed? Talk to me. I got it. All I need is a couple of dollars to put in my pocket, and you will earn the right to store these in your home without any interference whatsoever from me or any legal authority. All it takes is a fair exchange of money. So we've gone from Jethro Tull to autographed opera records. Pretty wild, huh? You never know what's going to happen on tech, Tent Talks Tunes. Let's see, what else can we talk about? I just went ahead and grabbed some real random stuff. <clears throat> Here's a pretty cool one, Elmore James. This is not like original, original, original Elmore James, but it is a 1960s pressing. <coughs> pretty decent shape. Do you want to hear some slide guitar playing Elmore James. I got it. Plays just fine. And as you know, when you're dealing with me, the price is right. What else we got here? What else am I trying to sell to you people? I had a nice uh, Jane's Addiction Ben Caught Stealing 12-inch single. Ben Caught Stealing on the A-side. Ben Caught Stealing, what's that, a remix? Album version, 12-inch 12 12 remix version, and a demo version of He Had a Diad. People used to not care about 12-inch singles at all. But now Record Store Day has made 12-inch singles a viable format again. People seem to really dig these things. Whenever I go out into the field on a record-selling gig, I sell a lot of 12-inch singles. I never used to be able to do that, but now I do. In fact, at my last record-selling gig, I sold one of these. Here's another one. You want it? Talk to me. It's in pristine condition. For some reason, it's got a grocery store sticker on one label, and somebody wrote 6406 on the back. Other than that, it's fine. And the vinyl, the vinyl is perfect. Perfect. Perfect, I'm telling you. What else have we got here? I am now in an official selling frenzy, guys. Of course, Harry the Cat is sleeping through the whole thing. He doesn't realize that when I sell these things, he benefits directly. He gets the cat food. He gets the cat litter. He gets the cat toys. I'm able to buy batteries for his laser pointer. He's just sleeping through this whole thing. He does not appreciate how hard I'm working for him. But you know what? He's a cat. That's the way cats roll. What else we got here? Ah, you want to do it to death? You want to do it to death? Do it to death with the JBs. That's right. James Brown's backing group, the JBs. This is some funky stuff. When I say funky, I mean funky. 
This was on James Brown's label called People Records, which was distributed by Polydor. Because in the 70s, James Brown had a contract with Polydor, and that's when he did his, like, real heavy funk stuff. You know, I think you could accurately say that his 50s and uh, up to, like, late 60s output would, would, would be considered R&B, rhythm and blues, vocals, but from about the early 70s on, it got funky. And he put out a lot of really good stuff on his label, People. These have been reissued um, like mad over in the last 10 years or so. But this is an original. This is a Stone Cold original people pressing of the JBs doing it to death. James Brown's backing band. It hardly gets more real than that. It's tough to find these in good condition, too, because a lot of these were, these were party records. Uh, finding, finding any kind of James Brown record in, in good condition is tough because they were played, you know, they were used. They were played to death at parties. They were done to death at parties. This one somehow escaped pretty much unscathed. I would say it's pretty darn close to mint condition. Play it at your next party. If it doesn't get the party going, you must be in a cemetery. What else have we got here in this crate of funky stuff? Ah, ha, ha, ha. Now here's something for you aficionados of the weird. I don't like to just sell you normal stuff or talk about normal stuff. As you know, this is Tent Talks Tunes, and we got to get into the oddities of the musical world. <clears throat> the term outsider music is a relatively recently coined turn, turn, term. Um, I give full credit to, um, why am I drawing him like Erwin Chusid of WFMU. He came up with the term outsider music to describe people like Florence Foster Jenkins. This is also an opera record. It is not autographed, but uh, Florence Foster Jenkins holds the distinction of being probably the single worst opera singer who ever lived. And I've heard this record, and I don't know a whole lot about opera, but I do know what's good. And man, she is terrible. This is really, really bad. Really bad in the great category of so bad that it's awesome. I have one of these in my personal collection. This is a spare. It's up for grabs. This was almost a full hundred years or whatever before the term outsider music was ever coined. Florence Foster Jenkins, along with other outsider pioneers like the Cherry Sisters and Les Petomaines, were making music that was so bad that you had to love it. I got it full-length, full-throttle LP version. Check it out. It's on the RCA Classical label. It's on the RCA Red Seal label, which proves it's classic. And is also in glorious, practically mint condition. So you can hear every single crack in her voice. You can hear every single bum note. You can hear every single overreach. You can hear every single overdramatic flourish. Beautiful. It's even packaged in one of RCA Red Seal's special custom poly bags. Oh, life is good. Life is good. This is proof that life is good. Don't ever doubt that life is good when you got someone like Florence Foster Jenkins waiting to fly into your record collection. What's next? Well, from the ridiculous to the sublime, how about this? How about a very nice original bona fide George Harrison Wonderwall soundtrack? This is on the original Apple label. You know, I'm a total mark for the Beatles and things relating to the Beatles. And I've talked before on Tent Talks Tunes about my earliest memories of uh, music and watching an original pressing of the White Album spinning around and around and around on the family turntable. So I've always had a great big fondness for original Apple pressings. And this is a really obscure one. This is, a, in the true sense of the word, a soundtrack album. This is George Harrison composing music for a soundtrack, and it's uh, mostly Indian-themed. Lots of sitars and tablas and uh, Indian classical themes. I think the movie was probably shown for about a week. It totally came and went. I don't even know if it's in print or in distribution anymore. 
And I guess this album sold enough when it first came out to where it's not like a super rare album, but it's been out of print for decades. It, it went out of print, I believe, in the early 70s. So you don't see them every single day. It's not like a rarity, but it's not common either. And if you like Indian classical music and ragas and stuff like that, and you like the Beatles and you like George Harrison, I got the album that's for you. Wonderwall Music. All you got to do is hook me up with some dollars and it's yours. If you're really in the mood for, for some George Harrison and let's say you want to get a uh, collection going, how about a nice original box set of All Things Must Pass? Here's one for you. It's the box. It's solid. The box opens. Remember I was showing you our deluxe package? Well, this is George Harrison's deluxe package. Triple album set. Not one, not two, but three custom inner sleeves, all intact, and original custom kind of like orange Apple labels. I've only ever seen this orange-ish Apple label on All Things Must Pass. And the condition on this disc, pretty darn good. Which means uh, the other discs must be pretty darn good, too. I can tell you one disc in this set that's going to be mint for sure. And that, of course, is the Apple Jam disc, the third record in the three album set. I have never, ever seen a copy of Apple Jam ever that looks like a needle ever touched it. And this is no exception. I don't think a needle ever touched the poor, bedraggled, misbegotten, forlorn Apple Jam disc. Um, I, I played one of these once, and I must say it's pretty pointless. It's just a bunch of really lukewarm uh, studio jams with whoever was around in the studio on a given day. Hey, whatever is George Harrison's right to uh, release whatever music he wants. And he did. And he sold a boatload of these things. It's kind of like a James Brown record. You really don't see them. Oh, that's in beautiful shape. Beautiful condition. All three discs. And the box is intact, too. You don't, you just don't find Beatles records or Beatles-related records in good shape. Even the box is in really good shape. These things are quite often torn up and smashed and split open, so... James Pogo informs us that Wonderwall is on DVD. Okay, it has been released. It is commercially available. And he says it's an odd movie. Sold. I want to see it. So if you're looking for a, a trifecta of George Harrison, well, you might as well get a nice original box set of Concert for Bangladesh. You guessed it. Box in beautiful condition. It's still in beautiful condition. Original booklet, fully intact, in great shape. And you guessed it. Not one, but two, but three, but a, a full hand of triple disc wonder of the concert for Bangladesh. And you guessed it, in stony, minty condition. These are not scratchy. They're not beat up. I am very, very picky with the conditions of the stuff that I flog to the public. Very picky. If it's not quite mint, I will tell you about it. The Jethro Tull trademark of quality, it's not quite mint. The Elmore James record, not quite mint. Everything else I've shown you so far, quite mint. All up for grabs, all for sale, all can be yours because, not if, but because, the price is right. What other kind of box sets do we have? Well, I was just going down there in the old storage facility and I came across a box set of the Fillmore Last Days. I actually have a couple of these. Fillmore Last Days has got the Grateful Dead, it's got the Santana, it's got a whole bunch of also rams. And some good stuff. Tower of Power, Boz Skaggs, New Riders of the Purple Sage, Hot Tuna. Actually, it's better than I remember it being Elvin Bishop Group, Malo, Sons of Champlin. This is a triple. It comes with a 7-inch single. There's a 7-inch single and a custom sleeve. I have two other copies of it. 
One's got the poster, the original poster, and an original unused Fillmore ticket. So you guys can either go no frills, this box, which is a little bit ratty, but still intact, but the vinyl's clean. You can go for the ratty box with the clean vinyl, or you can go for one of my other copies, which has a really nice box and all the vinyl and the poster and the original unused Fillmore ticket. I'm better than Eddie Money, baby. I got three tickets to paradise to take you to record collecting heaven. It is possible. It is plausible. It is happening. Now I said plausible, I said possible. Let's stay alliterative and talk about Pink Floyd. How about this, kids? Sealed promo 12-inch single on pink vinyl of Money and Another Brick in the Wall Part 2. Released only to record stores and radio stations. This is the way it came out. It's in a plastic bag with the sticker, the hype sticker, as the seal itself. This has never been opened. Never touched by human hands. Pink Floyd, pink vinyl, promo only. You want it? I got it. Sealed. Gotta warn you, it's not cheap. It's not cheap. Not cheap. It's, I'll say that it's, it, the price on it is one better than a certain Beatles song. And it's not 909. You guys know what I'm talking about. I'll bet you do. All right, all you heavy metal guys or hard rock gals or whoever or whatever you are. You like esoterica? You like kind of weird stuff? You like your rock heavy? How about a big, look at this stack, stack of ACDC 12-inch singles. These are all European, UK import 12-inch singles. Every blessed one of them. And if I'm not mistaken, most, if not all, have non-album B-sides. For example, this has a couple of live tracks. Live versions of Back, Black and... Well, what? Back in Black and TNT from 81 on the B-side. Uh, this one has a non-album track called Borrowed Time. Full-length live version from 1981 of Let There Be Rock. This is a limited interview picture disc, if you want to hear these guys mumble for 45 minutes. There you go. Uh, there's another one of those. Let's see, this has Who Made Who, a special collector's mix. Here's a mix that you can collect. What do you think about that, along with a live version on the B-side? ACDC sure do treat you right. Collector's mixes and non-album B-sides. Hotcha. None of these was ever released in the United States of America. Not a one. These are all European and UK only 12-inch singles. And they, they, uh, fill, they fall into the tradition, the rich tradition of British releases. What's this one got? Gatefold sleeve. Ba-dum, ba-dum, ba-dum. With, hey, video stills. Yeah, you got to give the people something. B-sides are Gozone and Snake Eye. I think those are all from the album. So, you know, what do you get? A gatefold sleeve. That's cool, kids. Never released in the U.S. This is an instant, get them all at once, collection of ACDC 12-inch singles. They can be yours. You know the drill. Let's talk. Let's talk turkey. Let's talk tunes. Let's talk paying the man. So I can put these in a box and send them to you, and you can be the envy of all of your neighbors. All of your neighbors will be jealous of you if they aren't already, you know, assuming that they're not already, when they see the fabulous collection of non-U.S. ACDC 12-inch singles. Nobody in your neighborhood's got that. I guarantee it. Nobody on your block has a collection like that. I know that nobody in my neighborhood does. Nope, they don't. I know they don't. I don't even, ha I don't even have to look. I don't even have to look. I already know they don't. Mm, 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 mm. 
Well, I'm just getting revved up now, man. I'm having a good old time. How about something you can just listen to that's awesome? You know, here's another one of these albums that uh, <clears throat> was part of my father's record collection when I was a young tot. And I remember so very well. This record got a lot of turntable play. Almond Brothers at Fillmore East. Normally, I utterly despise music that, that could be called, to use the modern-day parlance, jam band. This is the Allman Brothers, dude. This is the Allman Brothers. There is not one wasted groove on this entire album. Even on the epic 26-minute version, or however the heck long it is. 22 minutes and 40 seconds of Whipping Post. That's my favorite song on the album. It all goes somewhere. There's a purpose for it. There's a purpose of every single note played on this album. Every one of them. Original, gatefold sleeve. It was reissued without the gatefold. Original, pink Capricorn label. Straight out of Macon, Georgia. This is one of those records that is not in tip-top mint shape, but it is completely playable. There are no skips. There are no gouges. There is no obnoxious surface noise. If you want a just a good solid play copy or a good starter copy for somebody, this is the one. And it's quite inexpensive. 100% original and playable to the max. Talk to me, people. Talk to me. Here's a couple of groovy goodies. Oh boy. We all know that we love Captain Beefheart. How about this, guys? How about a Stone Cold Original first pressing? And you can tell by the all gold text on the front cover and the lower placement of the artwork and also the gold colored Buddha logo original first press of Safe as Milk by Captain Beefheart and the Magic Band. How else can you tell? First pressing red labels. Only the first pressing has the red labels. Unless, of course, they've come out with some reissue since then where they replicate the red labels. But this is original. It's original. First album by Captain Beefheart and the Magic Band. And this is another one of those. It's not quite mint, but I listened to it from start to finish. Plays just fine. And it is rarer than hen's teeth. Finding any kind of original 60s or 70s pressing in this album is tough. Never mind the first pressing. I got one right here. Doesn't have the bumper sticker. I've only ever seen one copy ever that had the bumper sticker. This isn't it, I'm sorry to say. But it is, for real, it is the first, and it is for you. You want to go for a perfecta on original Captain Beefheart albums? You got the first album, first pressing. How about the second album, first pressing? Strictly personal. Original gatefold sleeve, which with what I think is maybe the single best band photograph in the history of mankind. This is even better than your average anti-scene band photo. I had one of these on display in my home for many, many years. I had a copy of it that didn't have a record. Uh, so I just took the cover, opened it up, put it on the wall, and could gaze at it in complete wonderment for hours. Original gatefold sleeve. And how do you know that this is the first pressing of the second Captain Beefheart album? Well, once again, by the label. This has the black blue thumb label. This album is rare in any configuration as an original pressing, but the more common version has a tan label. It's got the tan label with the blue thumb logo like up to the, to the upper left part of the label, like right there. Only... The Puka first pressings have the black label. So think about that. The first two Captain Beefheart records, first pressings of each. 
I got them right here, right now. Maybe you want them right there, right then. If so, talk to me. Send me a message. As James Brown would say, you got the power. I got the records. You got the power. Woo, doggy, we're almost running out of time here, which is pretty good because I've just run into the last three records in my crate. You want to talk about nice originals? How about a trifecta of original Johnny Cash on Sun Records? Yes, indeed he do. These were issued, I'm pretty sure, in the early 60s. Sun. You've heard me talk a lot about the cheese ball Shelby Singleton version of Sun Records, which came into being in, the, I think, the late 60s, maybe early 70s. Pre-Shelby Singleton. This is Sam Phillips' Sun Records on really nice dinner plate vinyl. Original Sun labels. Original heavy tip-on jackets. This is solid cardboard, guys. You can tell by the brown inside. This is the real deal. I got not one, not one, not two, but three Johnny Cash Sun albums, and they all are in pretty good shape. I just might have to double check them, but these are just like those James Brown records and like those Beatles records. You hardly ever find these in any kind of mint condition. I think these might fall short of the mark in terms of mint. Actually, this one's, this one's pretty good. And one thing I've noticed about these ancient vintage pressings is they can take a real whipping and still play just fine. So I'm going to give these a needle test a little bit later, and that is absolutely one of the pleasures of doing what I do is I get to listen to these. When it comes time to grade everything, I play grade them. I get to play Johnny Cash records. Three in a row if I want to tonight. I'll, I'll say that playing a Jethro Tull record is not exactly a thrill and a half, but it's such a cool artifact that I really don't mind, so I'll do it anyway. I'll do it in the service of you, the discriminating, discerning record collector. And gosh darn, I was going to show all kinds of stuff like VHSs, and I got a whole stack of cassettes over here. I mean, I got so many cassettes. Really cool, awesome cassettes. I'll have to save them for another episode of Tent Talks 2, because it's been almost an hour. And the old larynx is getting just a little bit raggedy around the edges. You know, I don't want to push things too much. So it's a nice, neat place to wrap up, which is what I'm going to do. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. It's always a pleasure. Even if you guys don't want to buy a single record, I love talking about them. I love showing them. I love telling them. I love the physicality of them. And that's why vinyl is still with us after all these years. After the concerted efforts of the major labels to kill vinyl as a format, they couldn't do it. Because we, the people, know what's good. And vinyl is good. And I'm happy to preach that message to you. The converted. My kind of people. Yay. So yes, once again, thanks everybody for tuning in. If uh, the Lord is willing and the creeks don't rise, I should be back in about 167 hours time. So until we meet again, this is Malcolm Tent saying so long from the Nutmeg State.